We are accustomed to the idea that any moment in our lives can be captured just by pulling out a smartphone from our pocket. Of course, this was not always the case. At the time of the invention of photography, each picture was worth its weight in gold, and not everyone could afford a family portrait. In this collection, I invite you to delve into the past and familiarize yourself with unique photographs from bygone years. Enjoy the view. In this early 20th century photo, two women are captured. The combination of stern gazes, extremely long, loose hair, and flowing dresses makes them somewhat eerie. I don't know about you, but I immediately thought of the Japanese horror film, The Ring. The main villain of the movie, Sadako Yamamura, also had long hair and wore a loose-fitting dress. Of course, encountering women with such long hair nowadays is rare, but things used to be different. Long, thick hair has long been associated with beauty and femininity. Additionally, long hair held a certain sacred meaning. People believed that strength and energy were contained within them. Married women always styled their hair when leaving the house, and only little girls went out with loose hair. The women in the photo have beautiful, thick hair, which they likely took pride in. Perhaps if they had smiles on their faces, the photograph would not seem so gloomy. On the Reddit forum, a young woman posted a photograph showing her grandfather alongside Albert Einstein. This photo was taken in New York in 1941, a year after Einstein had gained American citizenship. Users noted the grandfather's resemblance to the great physicist, as well as how fortunate he was to have conversed with a true legend. Undoubtedly, this is true because Einstein was one of the greatest scientists in the history of humanity. He grew up in an era of technological progress. At that time, scientists were making numerous discoveries However, before Einstein, there was no one who offered a new perspective on our universe. Thanks to him, the world learned about the theory of relativity, the law of equivalence of mass and energy, the laws of the photoelectric effect, and much more. Einstein's second name is Genius. He is the author of more than 300 scientific papers on physics, as well as articles and books on philosophy and journalism. He held honorary doctorates from about 20 leading universities worldwide. And of course, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1922. I believe you would agree that the young woman who posted the photograph of her grandfather with Einstein has good reason to be proud of this photo. Looking at these photographs, it seems as if they don't capture ordinary lumberjacks, but rather dwarves, and all because the felled trees in the background are gigantic sequoias. In the second half of the 19th century, people continued to explore the territory of California. The gold rush was not enough. In their quest for money, gold miners retrained as lumberjacks. In the 1850s, the sequoia forest in California covered an area of over 8,000 square kilometers, but everything changed after people began the active felling of sequoia forests, which continued until the mid-20th century. All this ended with no more than 500 sequoias remaining in California. Sequoias are real giants among trees. Their height can exceed 100 meters. For example, a sequoia named Hyperion has a height of just over 115 meters. The most voluminous sequoia is known as Del Norte Titan. Its diameter measures 7.22 meters. Nowadays, on the western slope of the Sierra Nevada, there is the Sequoia National Park, created specifically to preserve this amazing tree. This photograph was taken in 1838 by French photographer Louis Daguerre. It captures the Boulevard du Temple in Paris. This ancient photo has been known for a long time, but it recently regained popularity, and here's why. An observant blogger named Gig Termond noticed that two black spots resembling human figures are present in the lower left corner of the photograph. Researchers from the University of Rochester became interested in this observation. They explained that by using multiple enlargements of the daguerreotype, they were able to confirm that there are indeed people in the shot. It turns out Daguerre captured a pedestrian who had stopped next to a shoe shiner. But how could it happen that only these two people appeared in the photograph when the boulevard was busy? The same observant blogger answered this question. He explained that in those years, photographers took pictures with a very long exposure time. Because these two people were stationary, they were captured in the frame, while the rest of the pedestrians on the boulevard were in motion.
The photograph captures happy guys and girls. They are joyfully laughing at something and seem like kind-hearted people. But what if I told you that they all worked in one of the concentration camps? Each of them took part in the genocide known as the Holocaust. Undoubtedly, it's impossible to blame all concentration camp employees for monstrosity. People in Nazi Germany were literally brainwashed. The Hitler regime instilled terrible ideas, prompting the killing and abuse of all those who didn't belong to the Aryan race. Of course, this fact does not absolve any of the Holocaust participants. Regardless of what is dictated by authority, each person should understand that none of us has the right to take another person's life. Perhaps the darkest period in the history of photography was the Victorian era. In the 19th century, a strange tradition emerged in European society, taking photographs of deceased individuals. For us, this may seem horrific, but at that time, this practice was popular. The first photograph in this style is considered to be Self-Portrait as a Drowned Man, created in 1840 by French photographer Hippolyte Bayard. However, in this photograph, he merely posed as a deceased person, but people were interested in this idea. By the end of the 19th century, many were taking post-mortem photographs of their loved ones. This practice even had its own peculiarities. Adults were usually photographed in a sitting position. They were dressed in beautiful clothes, the space around women was decorated with flowers, and blush was applied to their cheeks. Deceased children in the photographs could be in various poses, but more often like adults, sitting on sofas or chairs. Toys and flowers were were laid next to the little ones. Sometimes parents would sit next to them to get a joint photograph with the deceased child. Over time, photographers invented a special structure that allowed the deceased to be photographed standing. Looking at such photographs, it is almost impossible to guess that the person is deceased. Although Victorian post-mortem photographs may seem gruesome to us, capturing one's family was an expensive luxury at the time. Therefore, people reserved this option, so to speak, for the last resort. Thanks to such photographs, people retained memories of their deceased loved ones. Imagine driving through the desert landscape of Nevada for an extended period, and suddenly you see a small town. You decide to go in to rest, but it turns out that the buildings are empty, except for mannequins. Sounds creepy, doesn't it? In reality, such a town did exist. In the early 1950s, the United States conducted nuclear weapon tests. A settlement was built in Nevada that was an exact replica of an average American town. Additionally, European-style buildings, fortifications, roads, and gas stations were constructed. This settlement was called Doomtown and was built to study the effects of blast waves and radiation. Interestingly, the builders managed to recreate the atmosphere of a residential town. In each building were mannequins, which mimicked real people. They were dressed, and each was busy doing something. Some were dining at a table, while others were sleeping in bed. The town was built as part of the Threshold Program. With its help, the military tried to understand whether the population of any town could survive a nuclear bomb explosion occurring five kilometers away from the settlement. Once everything was ready, a real explosion occurred not far from Doomtown. After that, the military went to check what happened to the town and the mannequins. The aftermath of this explosion was captured in photographs and videos, which can now easily be found on the internet. Today, in the photography industry, there is high demand for children's photo shoots. Parents can choose any image for their child, the photo studio, and editing options. In the late 19th century, nothing like this existed. Moreover, the photograph was not taken in a fraction of a second, as it is now, but with a long exposure. The exposure time then ranged from 10 to 30 seconds. During this time, the person being photographed had to be completely still so that the shot wouldn't turn out blurry. And while an adult can do this, it's impossible to imagine a baby sitting in one position for that long. So how were small children photographed during the Victorian era? In the history of photography, there is a term called hidden mother. It's used to name a subgenre of early photography. In such pictures, the baby's mother would hold them during the lengthy exposure time. Since the photograph was supposed to feature only the child, the mother would be covered with various heavy fabrics. Hence, women holding their children were called hidden mothers. Of course, now we see that a person was hiding behind the fabric. But in the 19th century, there was simply no other way to take a portrait of a baby. 
This photograph captures American hunters proudly posing in front of a massive pile of bison skulls. It begs the question, what is there to be proud of? Killing such a large number of animals can hardly be called hunting. It's extermination. However, in the 1830s, Mass killing of bison was a strategic decision for Americans. Native Americans had lived off hunting throughout their history, and bison were their main prey. Killing the animals was essential for their sustenance, and they never hunted for sport. For this reason, killing bison did not seriously harm their population. Everything changed when U.S. authorities devised a covert war against Native Americans by destroying their primary food source. General Philip Sheridan himself admired this ingenious plan, highlighting its effectiveness. He even proposed creating a special medal for hunters to motivate people to kill as many animals as possible. In the 1860s, the extermination of bison reached its peak. Initially, the carcasses were processed for meat, but later they were killed senselessly. Americans were even offered the bloody entertainment of shooting from a train window as it passed a herd of bison. The number of bison killed at that time exceeded two and a half million per year. As a French biologist noted, American hunters managed to exterminate at least 75 million of these innocent animals in 40 years. That is a monstrous figure. Agree, the girl's face in the photograph looks terrifying. And all because of this strange mask, looking at which, it's hard to guess its purpose. Turns out, this accessory is nothing but a swimming cap. Swimming was a very popular activity in the 1920s and 1930s. At that time, the first accessories for this activity began to appear. One of them was this unusual cap, made in 1928. You may ask, why does it look more like a mask and why cover the face while swimming? The answer is simple. The creator of the cap presented it as an accessory for skin protection. While swimming in outdoor pools or bodies of water, our body stays in the water, while the head remains on the surface, exposed to harmful sun rays. With this cap, the person's facial skin remains protected. Despite the idea seeming useful, very few people wanted to swim with such a cap. The mascot of the world-famous fast food chain McDonald's is named Ronald McDonald. We know him as a cheerful red-haired clown with bright makeup, wearing quirky striped socks, a shirt, and a yellow jumpsuit. But in 1963, he looked different. This photograph captures the first image of Clown Ronald. A wild smile and gaze, tousled hair, a cup on his nose, a pizza box on his head, and eerie makeup. To us, modern people, such an image seems extremely unattractive. But in 1963, even in this form, Ronald managed to win the hearts of adults and children. The role of the first McDonald's mascot was played by Willard Scott. At that time, he was a very popular actor playing the role of Bozo the Clown. It was this character that inspired the fast food chain executives, and they decided that their mascot would also be a clown. Willard Scott's Ronald appeared in only three commercials, after which the actor was fired due to his weight. Ironically, the company didn't want fast food to be associated with overweight people. This photograph was taken during the Spanish flu outbreak. The massive pandemic raged from 1918 to 1920. The country where the patient zero was located remains unknown, although one of the first infection cases was recorded in Kansas. So, it's incorrect to assume that the Spanish flu got its name because it originated in Spain. In reality, Spain was the first to publicly announce the outbreak of the virus, as it was a neutral country in World War I. Regardless of where the virus appeared, the Spanish flu became a real disaster. The disease spread across all inhabited continents. About 550 million people got infected. The estimated death toll during the pandemic varies from 25 to 100 million people. The fatal outcome generally occurred due to severe pneumonia. In 2020, we faced a similar situation when the coronavirus broke out worldwide. Therefore, the photograph depicting a family in masks resonates deeply with modern people who have experienced mask mandates. In one of the social networks, a girl shared a photograph of her grandmother. She said that once, while looking through a family album, she noticed a strange detail. In this photo, her young grandmother sat on a chair, holding a gun in one hand. On her other hand, the granddaughter noticed traces of a white powder resembling talc. When she decided to find out what it was, her grandmother confessed that she secretly practiced wrestling. Despite being so beautiful and delicate, she held her own in fights against men. 
At the end of the 19th century, one of the most popular entertainment venues in Paris was the Cabaret de l'Enfer, which literally translates from French as Hellish Cabaret. It was built in 1892, but unfortunately was demolished in 1950. Therefore, now it can only be seen in surviving photographs. The owners approached its design creatively. The entrance door was shaped like the mouth of a wide-eyed demon, symbolizing a portal to hell. The exterior walls were adorned with drawings and sculptures in the same theme. Inside, visitors were greeted with a grim atmosphere. Ominous music played throughout the establishment. The walls resembled a cave, and the ceiling featured sculptures that depicted various demons tormenting human souls and bodies. Naturally, this unique venue was in high demand among Parisians. Interestingly, inspired by this this cabaret, another person opened a nearby cafe called Heaven, recreating the opposite ambiance within. In 1948, a horrifying photograph appeared in many American newspapers. It captured a woman with four children sitting on steps. Next to them was a large sign that read, For Sale, Four Children. Some people thought the photo was staged, but the story was real. The woman in the picture was named Lucille, and at that time she was pregnant with her fifth child. Her husband had lost his job and left with no money. They resorted to this monstrous act. Despite many people seeing the photograph, nobody helped Lucille's husband find work. However, the children were eventually sold. A girl named Anna and her younger brother Milton were bought by a farmer family, John and Ruth Zotman. The children suffered a lot in their new home, where they were beaten and made to do hard labor all day. In his teenage years, Milton couldn't stand the abuse anymore and retaliated against his stepfather. For this act, he was sent to a psychiatric hospital. After being released, he found his biological mother. By then, Lucille had remarried and had four more children. After living with his mother for several years, Milton moved to Chicago and got married. His sister Anna was raped by hooligans. When the farmers found out about her pregnancy, they sent her to a shelter for lonely women in Michigan. The fate of the two other girls is largely unknown, except that the older one, Sue, passed away in 1998 from cancer. Perhaps the luckiest was Lucille's fifth child, Bedford. At the time the infamous photo was taken, he was still in the womb. At the age of nine months, Bedford was adopted by the McDaniels. They said when they took the boy, he was emaciated, dirty, and flea-bitten. But they managed to raise him into a healthy, normal person. Now, Bedford lives in Washington and helps raise his grandchildren. Most war photographs are in one way or another related to cruelty and death. This photograph is an exception to the rule. The photograph was taken during the Korean War by one of the soldiers. It captures a touching story of saving a small life. An American soldier named Frank Payton heard a plaintive squeak on the battlefield. Under a bush, he noticed a small blind kitten left without a mother. Without hesitation, Frank took the kitten with him. In this photograph, you can see the soldier carefully feeding the defenseless kitten from a dropper. The photograph made it to the front pages of many American newspapers. Frank became one of the most famous soldiers of the 1950s for his honorable act. Now, this photograph shows that even war cannot destroy kindness if it exists in a human heart. This photograph is unique. Thanks to it, today we can see how the construction of the largest Hoover Dam took place and appreciate the scale of this exceptional structure. The photograph shows the executives of companies investing in the project inside a massive 45-ton steel pipe suspended over the future dam. The photograph was taken in 1935, a year before the dam was officially opened. The Hoover Dam is located in the lower course of the Colorado River, in the Black Canyon, on the border between the states of Arizona and Nevada. The dam houses Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the U.S. construction of the dam, began in 1931. It was named after the 31st President of the United States, Herbert Hoover. In the spring, the Colorado River often overflowed its banks, flooding farmlands. To tackle this issue, a dam construction project was developed. The structure was intended to help normalize the river's level, and the new reservoir would become the water source for Los Angeles and other areas of Southern California. More than 5,000 people were involved in the dam's construction. Its cost amounted to $49 million. Adjusted for today's prices, that's nearly $1 billion. Today, the Hoover Dam is the largest dam in the world. Its length is 379.2 meters, its base width is 200 meters, and its height is 221.4 meters. 
The maximum power output of its power station is 2,074 megawatts, and the total area of Lake Mead is 639 square kilometers. All Saints' Eve is considered the only day when the spirits of the deceased can return to Earth. Starting from the 16th century on this day, children and adults would wear frightening masks on their faces and go from house to house, asking for sweets. As the years passed, Halloween costumes became increasingly detached from the holiday's theme. Nowadays, at parties, you can encounter people dressed as superheroes or even anime characters. Such costumes don't invoke fear, unlike the costumes of the early 20th century. This photo is just one example of how people dressed for Halloween in the 1930s. Just look at those enormous masks on their heads. There are images of evil people, animals, and even a malevolent Mickey Mouse. Of course, the black and white photo adds gloom to such pictures. But if you were to encounter someone in such a costume at night, you could genuinely get frightened. Thanks to photographs from the last century, we can learn about the strangest events and activities that took place at that time. For example, you would never guess what is happening in this photograph, and why masks similar to the one Hannibal Lecter wore in The Silence of the Lambs are worn by the women. It turns out the photograph captures participants of the Most Beautiful Eyes contest, which took place in California in the year 1930. As you may have guessed, the aim was to select the woman with the most beautiful eyes, hence the rest of the face was hidden under a mask. It's unclear why such a strange design was chosen for the masks. The women looked both ridiculous and frightening, despite it being a beauty contest. Interestingly, similar contests were conducted annually for many years, but later, the mask was replaced by a scarf covering the face below the eyes. This photograph was taken in the early 20th century. Back then, children were not spoiled with gadgets and an abundance of toys. They enjoyed walks with their parents, socializing with peers, and always found activities they liked. The boy in the photograph was one of those children of the last century. In the picture, he stands, heart pounding, as he waits for his dad to give him a birthday gift. The little boy doesn't know yet that his dad is holding what he has been dreaming of behind his back, a small, fluffy, white puppy. We don't know anything about this little boy, but looking at this photograph, we feel what he felt at that moment. And we can all imagine the immense, genuine happiness that remained off camera. That's all for me. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to rate it, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon. Your activity is the best reward for me. Thank you for your attention. See you soon. Goodbye.